Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm John Mitchell, one of the founders of Rep Fabric, and wanted to uh, just uh, offer my gratitude for you joining us here today. We've got a, a program that I've presented before to a couple of different trade associations called Rep of the Future that we've updated with some of the modern thinking given the COVID-19 world that we've got today. Um, so what we're going to do is talk for about an hour about the trends that we see. So as Rep Fabric um, naturally, we cross a lot of different types of industries from food and beverage all the way through furniture, through uh, lots of electrical, electronic, power and motion, plumbing, uh, HVAC, and so on and so forth. And this is really kind of what we've seen are the emerging trends in what the rep of the future may look like. And naturally, this is kind of where we're driving our own product development as well. Um, so with that, just a quick background on our company. Uh, we've, we are basically a company of about 20 people. We were reps for, for many years. I ran a rep agency for about 12 years, and uh, we had a 10-man firm in the state of Florida, mainly in the elect electrical, electronic market. And we kind of worked in two different modes. One mode was in the ability to chase jobs and projects at end users to get spec position, and then also the other mode of, of uh, working with distribution to make sure that you've got kind of stock and flow product running through their channels as well. So um, before we get started, though, I wanted to kind of point out a, a few things we're doing today. Uh, on this Friday, feel free to join us if you, if you, you know, if this is beneficial to you and like to learn a little bit more about what the Rep Fabric selling and commission tracking platform does, please check us out on Friday at 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, and we're going to run through kind of the sophistication of our existing solution for manufacturers reps that ranges really from the front end CRM first touch of a business card all the way through to the commission dollars that that same contact may generate and how we track it throughout the whole process and, and really, you know, enhance your sales teams to be augmented as we'll talk a little bit more about today. Also, I'd also uh, want to invite you to Charlie Hawk's presentation from Growth Dynamics on June 8th. It's all about the conditions problem uh, and the fact that it's not actually a conditions problem, that it's an equipment challenge. And the thrust of this, Charlie, he's got a company that specializes in sales trainings and he's a really fantastic speaker. And he's going to go through the fact that as most rep firms, we've been really tooled and, and engaged in being outside sales reps. And for the first time in COVID-19 world, we're being asked to sell from the inside out. And he's going to take us through some of the techniques and best practices for doing that, primarily around sort of the soft factors around attitudes, tactics, and activities, not hard skills, but the intent behind how you would apply those hard skills. So I hope you guys can join us for that too. And, and like I said, he's a great speaker uh, and he's got a great company. So he's going to bring us some of the best practices uh, from, you know, from working with hundreds and hundreds of rep firms over the years that he's done. So uh, I encourage you to join us with that on, on June 8th as well. So let's get started. What I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to share my screen. So I'm going to uh, make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Just bear with me one second. There we go. Yeah, so as I mentioned, this would be uh, Friday, this Friday at 2.30, our, our selling commission platform, which is what we do at Ref Fabric, and then also uh, June 8th, talking about the equipment challenge that many of the outside team that we've been faced with uh, trying to sell from the inside out. So, um, so in any case, let's get started. I'm John Mitchell, and uh, let's see here. So today's presentation is about the rep of the future. And as I mentioned, really, this is just kind of where we see it going, you know, and, and in general, uh, reps are not going away. And if anything, I think we're really going to thrive. But probably a lot of the roles that we have may change just a bit. And, um, and in, you know, and, and also a lot of the day to day work that we'll have to do. Um, but that's not changing in the same classic way in that we are relationship people and we will continue to keep those relationships with our customers and distributors. So this is really just a presentation that we built from talking to lots of our rep uh, groups that we support as well as um, you know, lots of the digital technologies that we've had time to research and bring to bear so that it becomes applicable to your rep business. Um, so with that, let's get started. So 
as you know, and, and as you guys certainly have built great businesses on, which is better? It's being out in front of customers and not being stuck behind doing a lot of paperwork in your rep business. And really, that's the ultimate goal is that the more rocks and the more active selling that you can turn over and do, the more chances are your income will grow as well as you know the, the performance that you got for your manufacturers, keeping them happy and uh, and so on and so forth. And And really, that's what we're trying to get everybody towards is how do we spend less time on the paperwork side of the business and there are big challenging you know daunting tasks of of that paperwork that range from tracking sales and commissions uh through 10 different formats one for each manufacturer that pays you differently and in different time orders as well as even the paperwork of just the simple stuff around keeping a company rolodex for example uh, which will become more and more important in one leg of your marketing in the future that you'll ultimately certainly be doing uh so so really that's that's what we're trying to do though in the ultimate game is to stay out in front of your customers and that's what we're pushing for and as reps here's what we do right it's uh number one our charter is to identify new business we know who we should be selling to, what contractors, what designers, what engineers are going to be the people that will be specifying our product in the future so that ultimately that pulls through and through sales and through distribution uh, as well. We pursue that business. That's the second charter that we have. So we're the grease in the equation in that, you know, many of our manufacturers sometimes are hard to do business with, but we make it simple, simpler for our customers by navigating the manufacturer for them. At the same time, uh, we pursue business because maybe, you know, there's supply chain factors. How soon can we get it? Uh, or the price is too high that needs to be addressed in order to make the business work. And ultimately that's, you know, that's kind of what we do in that pursuit process. And then finally, we close the business and closing the business doesn't necessarily mean that we are, um, you know, got the purchase order for the manufacturer. Closing the business from a manufacturer's rep standpoint truly means that it, it's not only closed and you got the PO for your manufacturer, but you're also getting paid for it, uh, which might be 60, 90 days down the road. So so ultimately a real win, so to speak, on a, on a project that you do or on a job that you do. Uh, opportunity that you close is ultimately about how that shows up in your commission check and being able to track all that. The problem is, is to do all that of that 50 hour work week, a typical sales rep would put in only about 12 hours, according to trade studies are spent actively selling, doing basically nose to nose business with your customers where you're engaged, whether that be through email, through webinar, through phone calls or, or in-person visits, where you're truly out selling and discovering new opportunities that you can turn into sales dollars and turn into commission dollars. That's not a high number, um, which means that the 38% or 38 other hours that people are spending, they're doing other stuff. And what is that other stuff? Well, some of it you can't control like planning and travel, Things like customer service are mainly uh, supporting the existing revenue that you have. Quotes and orders are kind of along the same line there. Certainly strategic elements to it for how you do that. And certainly you can burn bridges if you blow it. Um, but ultimately, that's kind of keeping the revenue you've already got. And then you'll notice the big one is administrative. That's at 24% that is really just you know spent doing stuff. Uh, around paperwork types of tasks and, and managing and planning your business. So uh, these aren't numbers that we make up. These are from Pace Productivity and Alexander Groups, which are companies that studied specifically the workplace behavior of salespeople. And they really can't do it on reps, but this is probably the closest data that we've been able to find uh, that, that really talks about the active selling nature of our business. If you want to boil that down into the true value of the time that your team puts in, and what I mean by that time is what is their hourly cost in a sense? Uh, so if they're only spending 12 hours a week out in front of customers, what is that really costing you to support those people and your business? And let's just kind of run through a quick scenario here. So if a salesman who makes normally 140,000 a year for the firm in terms of earned commission income that comes into the agency, you figure about expenses from uh, things like your car, uh, you know, the car, the lease payment, uh, overhead around the, you know, the sales inside sales team or, or non-compensated overhead GNA expenses as well as your healthcare expenses, you figure about 40,000 of that person's 
uh, net net income coming into the company probably goes to that on an annual basis. Also on an annual basis, you figure there's about 260 working days. That's the complete deck of uh, working days, but I know lots of businesses they're really over the holidays or for much of December practically shut down. So that number is a little suspect and a little bit high, but I think it will illustrate kind of the point we're making here. And we, we learned from the earlier trade study that the average was about 10 hours per day per salesperson. So, um, so when you add all that up, what does that turn into? Well, that means that your salesperson needs to bring about $540 per day uh, for every working day out there uh, $500, uh, a little more than $500 a day in real commissions earned by the company. Otherwise, that that salesperson is sort of marginally worth it, and you're not you're not really getting ahead, right? And and more profitable as a company. So this number for most companies, I believe, is very low. It's probably much higher. It's probably more like $800, $800 a day. And that's really before you've got a lot of the contributions uh, to the ownership and, and you know the rest of the company as well. Now, you also figure that if 2.4 hours a day are spent actively selling, that means that the average cost per sales call is about 225 bucks a sales call. That's pretty expensive. You know, we see numbers all the time that people are talking about $400, $500 per sales call, and certainly on their highest earners, it probably is that. And the reason I bring that up is you don't want to just blanket $225 around to any customer who's willing to see you. You want to target the ones that you have the best chance of making uh, sales to and commissions to and so on and so forth. And, you know, we always talk about how just in general, people get into the mode of comfort selling and going and seeing their friends. Well, at 225 bucks per sales call, uh, that's you know that's not a great way to to, to keep running the business. So, um, but the point is is that once you kind of know that number and you understand that only about 12 hours a week or about 20 20 percent of that time is being spent out in front of customers, the question really becomes how do I increase that to be 45% of our time selling, actively engaged nose to nose with customers? And, and that's really the key. How do you do that? Well, if you think about what you did, if you just sold at the same rate that you're doing today, uh, you know, in the 12 hours active sales call calling, and you got that up more to 20, 20, not even 20 hours, you can basically do the math and say that instead of that $540 per day in commissions, you truly could be earning that same person if they could be selling 45% of the time, could be earning over $1,000 a day in commissions. And obviously that makes everybody happy. That makes your manufacturers happy. That makes um, certainly, you know, the person happy who's, who's going to earn more and, and, and the ownership happy as well. So uh, the other thing of note there is that you also are dropping your cost of sale down to 125 bucks per sales call, which means you can make more mistakes and, and go on places that you, you wouldn't necessarily do otherwise. So as we as we start to unpack this and peel back the layers of the onion for 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 how this is going to influence our, our behavior in the future as sales reps, Let's talk a little bit first about how the business has changed. So in the old days, for the most part, and certain industries have more of this remaining than others, but we had what we call, what I call channel control. In other words, the rep controlled a significant part of the business for who got the business, what distributors got the business, uh, who, you know, we were important to see because we were the guys that contained all the technical knowledge and so on. So, so for instance, some of these bullets that we used to always handle would be things like samples that always came through us. Uh, technical books always delivered by us, right? Everybody remembers the truck, you know, the trunk full of data books, right? Um, orders generally less than two thousand or ten thousand dollars went through distribution, and otherwise, manufacturers took a lot of that business direct. We provided a lot of technical expertise as reps as well, and manufacturer management didn't really care where dollars came as long as you kept those POs coming, and uh, and they didn't really ask you for any kind of management reports or anything like that around where your future dollars would be coming from, as long as you just keep those POs up. And again, um, you know, the, probably the biggest takeaway is customers had time and wanted to see us. I think we're all challenged, but for the, you know most senior management uh, in in 
distribute, you know, in distribution and, and in the rep groups, we're all challenged by time where things like golf with a customer are really hard to find because uh, that customer has to take a day off of a vacation, for example. So uh, the point is, is that customers really wanted to see us because we had a lot of this control. Today, how it's changed is that things like samples are often, you know, fed by distributors with next day delivery, right? Um, technical data is available online and most orders go through distribution. So even, you know, even the smallest orders or the largest orders typically go through distribution and set up supply chain programs and so on uh, with those big customers. Distributors, application engineers or distributor technical experts provide a lot of that technical expertise that we as reps have historically provided. Manufacturers want our funnel data. So today a manufacturer's you know, senior management, most of these people have MBAs. They've been teaching, uh, you know, data-driven decision-making for in MBA schools for 25 years. And now the ability to not turn in reports to manufacturers to talk about the projects and the jobs and the opportunities that you're working on really, uh, you know, it is becoming kind of a more and more challenging to resist uh, because these folks are driven by data. So um, lastly, customers have value or have time to see us only if we add time. And and so here's, I'm, I'm going to continue to kind of talk about trade studies that are quote unquote the bad news. And then I'm going to pull the, the nose up on the plane here. But I think all of us have seen this these kinds of metrics that are written by people who are uh, really proponents of web-based marketing, right? And that's where all these trade studies have happened. And certainly from a B2B industrial sense and supply chain sense that we as reps really support, you know, I think all of us need to take this with a grain of salt, but this is just interesting data points nonetheless. One is, you know, when you start a research pro project as a, as a customer buying something for the first time, where do you start? And you'll notice that 70% go to a search engine, um, brand manufacturers websites would be number two if you bought product from a brand before you want to see what else they have because it's probably forward compatible in some manner. Then you'll go to an industry distributors website, a consumer site or Amazon business. And this is from Forrester in terms of how people really start the procurement process uh, in B2B sales. The other thing you hear are buyer behavior changes that are ongoing right now where buyers are online researching and buying their products for work. 63% of buyers research half or more of their work purchases online before purchasing. 32% of buyers will make, um, and expected to go to 53%, will make half or more of their purchases online. A lot of folks go to Amazon, especially, you know, depending on the end market that you're in and how engineered that product is, um, you know, they're starting to go to Amazon more and more. And this is the one that always strikes fear. Buyers are 60% of the way through their purchasing journey before ever contacting the rep. Well, to be honest, we can throw all of this out because this is when they are talking about people, you know, buyers doing research online and not contacting a rep. Think about what we are as manufacturers reps. We're active sellers. So we disrupt that online research process by being in front of the buyer, by being, you know, having the right products to talk about and demonstrating the expertise to de-risk that purchasing for the buyer so that they're getting the right product at the right time at the right price. And, um, and so ultimately that's really our rep value is that we can disrupt this kind of normal, what we call inbound selling where the buyers come to you and you suck them in as a manufacturer, you can disrupt that by having the active field sales people going in knocking on doors and saying, hey, I see you're about to design this 150 frame uh, horsepower, you know, half horsepower motor. What, uh, you know, here's how it's going to work and here's how you tie it all up and make it, you know, make it fit this application. So, so in a sense, if you, if, if you look at what we do, the ideal channel really depends on whether these customers are making a first time purchase or a repeat purchase. And according to a McKinsey study back in 2018, this is kind of what, what they came up with was when a buyer is buying a new product for the first time or a new service for the first time, 76% of the time they want to talk to the salesperson. And that's us, the reps, right? Uh, when buying a previously purchased product with slightly different specifications, 52% of the time, they want to talk to us when buying exactly the same product again it really just goes into more of a, a kind of a clerical mode 
and they don't really need to talk to us. They just reorder it. Life goes on. And, and ultimately, if you think about it, this is what we do as reps. So we're that front end person helping them spec the right products, helping them get to the right um, solution for their, you know, for their, their systems and, and the projects that they're working on and so on and so forth. And that's why we as reps are never going to go away because we can do stuff that you can never answer just on a website. And, uh, and, and so that's the point behind it. But what has changed, right? So what's the number one rule of sales? The number one rule of sales really is you have to go to where your customers are. Right. You got it. So if you're a financial advisor, you go to the country club and and talk to the, you know, the rich folks at the country club. And and ultimately, that's been the rule of sales for forever. That's also why we as field salespeople go out on the road for three or four days and drum up a bunch of business, turn over a bunch of rocks. Um, and so ultimately, we have to go to where our customers hang out. And I think this is part of what's changing, though, is that in the future, our customers are kind of really in two tiers. One is physically where they're located and the projects they're working on. But two is a lot of times they're hanging out online. Right. So how do we make sure that we get to that process? Well, here's how we need to get digitally amplified as reps. We need to get louder and we need to get in in their orbit a little bit better than we do today. And that's what we mean by digitally amplified. Um, so in order to do that, there's really a couple of different pieces. One is what they call inbound marketing, which is when the buyer finds, finds you because you demonstrate expertise on your site for how to configure this factory, how to configure a new hospital uh, and so on. And that really comes from, you know, things that you guys have probably engaged in and other customers that range from blogs, white papers, email campaigns, things like that. And then the second thing would be the outbound marketing side, which would be cold calling, cold emailing, on-site visits and the active selling, which is really what we've been doing as reps for a very long time. Um, and so what you know, the, the nature of the changing buyer behavior is really going to require both legs. There might be 25% of your business that could be drawn in or, or grow out of the inbound marketing space, for example, because you put together a significant number of, of video series for how the new products from one of your manufacturers solves a problem for a customer. Um, and so the point is with this is that ultimately you're going to need both, right? So how, how do we build something like this? And this is always the challenge, right? As reps, we're, we're busy, we're in the whirlwind, we've got phones ringing off the hook, we've got too many emails to answer. And a lot of times that's churn business, it's not really strategic business that's growing, it's just transactional stuff, we're trying to get it off our plate. Well, what we have to do is really automate these processes so that the right leads and the right salespeople are following up on uh, the jobs, the projects, and the opportunities that stand the best chance of making commission dollars for your agency. And so what I would propose to you is that since reps are, are coin operated, right? Um, uh, as, as one of our friends, Brian Shirley, who's the former president of MANA, likes to say all the time, reps are coin operated. I thought I'd put a little analogy in around uh, building a personal ATM machine for you. And ultimately, a rep business and your book of business within that rep business can be a truly a personal ATM machine. But there are three things that you have to do to enable that. One is you have to load it with cash. And in the sense, cash really is from a rep and B2B selling perspective, qualified leads, meaning that these are leads that you stand a fairly good chance of closing and winning some business on. Second thing you wanna do is you need to uh, have a working dispenser mechanism. All that machinery inside the ATM needs to work so that finally it can spit out cash. And in order to unlock where to go, you need a pin number to make sure that that thing is ultimately unlocking that. So we're gonna kind of talk through each of these little stages here and um, and let's let's go. So the first thing is loading things with uh, qualified leads. Most people say, oh, I need more and more opportunities. Well, actually, you don't. What you really need are more and more leads. And I don't know about you guys, but when I had my you know, when I had my rep agency, I think we got a lead from a manufacturer maybe once a week total and the rest was up to us. So manufacturers aren't marketers in many cases. They build great products. Um, but uh, sometimes their marketing leaves a little to be desired. And at the same time, you as reps have the very best Rolodex and the very best list of contacts in your territory, which is ultimately why you get hired for them. So the idea is how do we unlock that? And, 
And one thing I would say is that if you think about it, if you grow your leads by 10%, your business will grow by 10%. It's, it's just a flat curve. And, um, and the problem is everybody says, oh, we need more opportunities. Well, actually, you don't. You need more leads because if you close your, your opportunities at the same rate from that same lead, then uh, you know, your, your business is going to grow just as a result of that. And how do you get those leads? Historically, it's been pretty expensive to do some of this stuff. And historically, people have manually been doing this for a while. So they've been looking at, this, you know, customers to dis, you know discover new companies on LinkedIn, for example. And even if they discover the right company, they might send a few one-off emails to the person trying to get connected. Uh, and, but ultimately, that person may be working on a project that is keeping them busy and they're not really selecting products at this time. So they don't care and they blow you off and nothing ever really happens. So there's kind of a timing element to it. And, and that is where it also gets challenging and tricky. So is there a better way? And the answer is there can be. Um, so what you have to do is detect and capitalize on the marketing signal. A marketing signal is when a B2B buyer or engineer says, hey, I'm interested in your products because I've done something that's indicated that interest and or you're checking in with me on a regular pulsing basis so that that marketing signal happens and you don't miss the opportunity to do your spec work and you don't miss the opportunity to make sure they know about your new products that might be stock and flow products and, and so on and so forth. So detecting and capitalizing on that marketing signal really kind of takes two forms, what you're doing today and what you're going to you know, potentially be looking at doing in the near future. Today, most people are doing emails and responses where you're just having a conversation back and forth with a prospect. Um, sometimes people will mine things like the first time they purchase the light bulb, they want to purchase the socket next. So you look at your sales history by part number and figure out key parts that you know you can wrap the rest of your line card around. You'll talk to your distributors for their insights and who uh, they think are good, you know, architects, engineers, designers, um, uh, you know, facilities managers, et cetera, that you should be talking to, to, to get that stuff specced in. And then you'll do things like one-off cold targeted emails where you're just sending an email to someone who uh, you thought could be a fit. A lot of times, obviously, you're pulsing that salesman who has the local territory knowledge for them to come up with, uh, you know, when they think things will move. And a lot of times you're even waiting for your, you know, for your, your existing competitors who have the business at an account to melt down. And a lot of people are starting on the mass blast email campaigning, you know, I, I, and, and reps are at all different stages in these processes. So you guys might be very advanced and, and far more advanced than what we're talking about here and starting to do uh, these second things. But, and, you know, a lot of folks are still just getting started with just managing this side of it as well. And that's fine, but you're thinking about it and that's what's good. So um, in the past, however, these kinds of things used to be too expensive. And social media postings, online videos, website SEOs, buying lead lists, retargeting, webinars that you're conducting about arc fault prevention or the new uh, XYZ widget series, that kind of stuff is really just, you know, it's, it's been too expensive for you as whirlwind uh, encapsulated sales rep people who don't have time to really work on all this stuff. Um, you know, you, you just don't have the BTUs to do it in the past. And it's been expensive and you really don't get paid any part of that manufacturer's marketing budget. It has to come out of your commissions if you even wanted to do that stuff, which is kind of a second, you know, second challenge that needs to be discussed with your manufacturer. So here's what we did. We actually took a, um, a list of uh, customers. So one of our rep groups that we work with uh, is, is, you know, took some, we call them experimental dollars, just to try this and see how it worked. And that's what we're gonna share with you today. Uh, so what you see is in this case, social media and LinkedIn and Facebook. And, and just in terms of how this advertising works, and I'm sure you guys have all been advertised through this, through these channels on a regular day in day out basis. Well, it might be something to consider as a competency that ultimately you wanna develop. So let's take a look at some of these results. In this case, we just targeted an audience to say, Give me everybody who's a mechanical engineer, mechanical, electrical engineer, anybody with engineer in their title, uh, power engineering, and so on and so forth. And we did it through uh, the geography of the of the New England states. And the question is, how many people on these on these platforms really does that match to? And the answer in this case 
is about 120,000 people. So it's a significant number of people that have profiled themselves for these platforms very, very thoroughly because they're either looking for their next jobs or um, you know want to brag about their roles to their friends and, and so on and so forth. So point is, the data is usually pretty decent. And, uh, and it's quite a few people. And if you think about if you can get in front of those 120,000 people who fit your market, uh, there's a very good chance that at least 10 of them are going to come and turn to you for some solutions. So, uh, you know, what does that really add up to? Well, let's take one that we actually really did. In this case, we did it in Southern California for everybody who's in the field of study of electrical engineering. And, um, and what we did was we said, OK, we actually hired an ad agency because they had the expertise to, to do this. And budget wise, it ended up being about a thousand bucks per manufacturer per month. Uh, and then we advertise and use that money across SEO, across LinkBook and you know, or, yeah, LinkBook, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook. We did some network retargeting and so on and so forth. So we, we kind of hit it full bore. And um, what we put together was in this case an engineered product, which was all around a component called a D-sub, which is a connector in the electrical space. And um, the, the rep firm was called Kai Connect, and they they promoted these, these specific products for Omnetics, which is their manufacturer on their line card. And they did it in, in ads that look like this on social media. Um, and so in week one, in Southern California, which is the only only area they targeted, they did 14,000 views, which means 14,000 people looked at it, 123 people clicked on it because they were interested, and what they paid was $1.21 per click. Their ad spend ended up being 184 bucks for that one week, not, you know, not too bad. Um, secondly, they got smarter about it because once we were able to narrow and profile the audience a little bit better, 100% uh, click through and, and improvement, which dropped our ad spend down to $82. Now, this 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 uh, process actually yielded out of those 123 clicks, several orders for samples. One of them turned into real commission money for this account, like you know, 10, 15k as they got spec in a, at a at a big uh, uh, electronics OEM. Uh, so so this is. What they also did from an SEO perspective, they put it as their rep firm and they're developing their rep firm. And by the way, the manufacturer in this case was blown away by how innovative they were in running these types of campaigns. Uh, and, and what they ended up doing was going back to the manufacturer, showing the results of what they were able to accomplish with that and say, hey, Mr. Manufacturer, I don't want to use my commission dollars for this because I need that to run my company. However, I will continue to do this if you comp me some dollars out of your marketing budget because I have the best Rolodex and I've got the people to get this done. And they agreed. So they actually started increasing them on a, on a co-op dollar basis uh, throughout, you know, throughout that period of time. Highly encourage you guys to take a look at, at possibly doing that. So part, you know, the other part to it, though, is that you, you have to have something that works, right? It's got to be content that people will engage with. So it can't be too salesy. It's got to be content they love. A lot of times it's great if it's it's funny. And a lot of times it's great if it informs them on, on uh, you know, how to build a waterproof blah, 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 or here's why this new cutting tool is the best ever, or here's the aesthetic, you know, groove in the lightness of the room because of these products, you know. Um, nothing too sales pitchy, things that are easy to digest. You know, everybody talks about we've got about a seven second attention span total and it must have a hook which sort of routes them to the next stage that ultimately leads to what we're going to talk about next. So how do you do this? Again, um, develop your demand, your demand generation online. When we talk about marketing, we're not talking about branding of shirts and pens. That's brand marketing. We're talking about demand generation marketing and have a meeting with your manufacturer and their marketing people and start to lay out a plan for how people in your Rolodex can engage with you at the time so that you can detect that marketing signal and get in there and, and spec your products in way ahead of your competition ever doing the same thing. Um, then, you know, beyond that, you see lots of other types of uh, options here, things like videos, right? So manufacturer launches a new product, why not put together a little video on how it's used? And in a sense, you know, 
you becoming the face of your manufacturer in your local market or even broader than that is a very, very good thing for your manufacturer's stickiness level too. Uh, you know, if you've got a hundred videos on their stuff, typically they're not going to get, you know, fire you as a rep, right? Um, so the point is, is that uh, things like that are very easy to do with an iPhone and, you know, it takes it takes getting out of your comfort zone. And that's part of what uh, Charlie Hawk is, is going to talk about in the equipment challenge um, webinar we have coming up. But it's things like that. Uh, and then take a look at these other things uh, that you can get most of the time from your manufacturers anyway, and then look at things like marketing automation. Uh, and then, you know, so that's the inbound side of it. What about the outbound side? Well, do what you're doing, but do it smarter and faster. And so continue that process. So now that you've got qualified leads, if you go back to our ATM analogy, uh, this is really the layer one. The second thing we have to do is that we've got to get these leads so that we turn them into real opportunities. And in order to do that, if you have no business process around taking these leads, if you just get a big list of Excel leads and you give it to your salespeople and, and sort of hope and a prayer uh, that they'll follow up on them and they're already busy working their own deals, um, normally that's not going to work. It, it certainly didn't work in my rep agency. And, um, and so what we have to do is create a consistent process and we have to have the bandwidth to run down those leads. So uh, the point is, if you go spend 200 bucks on a series of leads and Facebook ads and so on and so forth, uh, the value of that leads zero if nobody ever does anything with it. And so we don't want you to create a money shredder. What you really have to do is make sure that you're not dropping balls along the way. And typical ball dropping behavior we see, I'm sure these have come, you know, these came out of my rep uh, company experience. Oh, we forgot to deliver the samples. I forgot to follow up on the quote. A lot of times manufacturers, you know, they're, they're getting more strict about prove to me that this business is because of you, you know? Um, and then finally, I never told my line about this particular deal and now it's gonna book outside of my territory and I can't claim those dollars as a result of it. So what you have to do is you have to put a, a field sales process together and get your, your salespeople to uh, basically buy into and adhere to that sales process and be able to use that sales process to control the chaos in their lives and in your lives, right? And what that field sales process, simple version of it can look like, and this is just one that's kind of generic and every company usually tunes it to themselves uh, to work, you know, work best with the least amount of input for them. Um, things like leads become a qualified lead. So just a big list from a trade show doesn't mean that they're going to be potential buyers. Let's qualify that lead. And then at this point, you know, we're going to target them. So we're going to start to engage with them with email, phone calls, maybe a visit. Uh, a lot of times that'll turn into a request for samples. Do those samples get submitted? Maybe they get requests for quotes and that quote might have to go through distribution. Maybe that quote finally gets submitted. Ultimately, you get the win, which might look like a purchase order or it might look just, you know, be a confirmation from the customer. Hey, we're going to use this stuff in the buy. Ultimately, that PO gets booked. Ultimately, that PO gets acknowledged by your manufacturer. You might not even see that at all as a rep. It might just happen in the background. And finally, that product gets shipped. And then do you get paid? And so that back part of it, you don't often have a lot of visibility to. And if you look at every one of these arrows from a field sales process, if you think about how you collect dollars at 225 bucks per visit, and you made two visits before they requested a sample, you got $500 invested in this deal before you even get started. Right. And so anywhere you drop the ball along this process really is the time and the energy that you spent into this deal vaporizing in front of you, you know, and uh, and ultimately that's what we want to try to eliminate as much as possible or eliminate as fast as we can. Um, so every green arrow really represents that ball drop op opportunity. And that's why you want to have a structured field sales process, just like the ATM mechanism, you know, is, is a well-oiled mechanical machine because it just tees them up and marches them down and gets those dollars uh, out, out the door. So that's part one on, on what we call digitally amplified. How do we grow our online presence as reps? Uh, we just kind of gave you a couple of different examples of, of how other reps are doing it. Um, the second thing is getting digitally augmented. So now that you've got your leads, now that you've got a business process, what could you do to be as effective as possible as a salesperson? And, um, and so the first thing is, let's talk again about changing buyer behavior. You have to nail the customer experience, meaning customers today, you know, many of whom are, are millennials that are 
you know, engineering managers and designers themselves that are running their own businesses uh, really expect total personalization, right? They want, to, they want you to make them feel like you're the only customer they have. They want more options. I want this in green, not blue. Can you do that? Right. If not, they're moving on. They want consistent contact. Doesn't have to be every day, but they want to hear from you on a regular basis to know that you care about their business. Finally, they want you to listen closely and respond quickly because if somebody else can respond faster than you can, more than likely they'd go down that line. And finally, the last piece is really that the frontliners have more control. So what is my pricing on this? Can you tell me right now? Uh, not, not, I don't know. Let me get back to the factory and I'll get back to you. Uh, let me, you know, the factory said it would ship last week. I'm surprised you haven't got it yet. Uh, that kind of thing people really have less and less tolerance for. And then, uh, you know, other things like let me ask my boss or the one that happened. You bought that from me. I mean, I know I personally have gotten caught by that uh, as a rep, you know, a few times. You bought that from me. I didn't even know that manufacturer was selling into this particular account. So you got to nail the customer experience. And that comes with the training on your sales team and, and the idea that everybody understands that these are the kinds of answers that you want to have ready to go. Um, part B of that is taking all of the information that you get from your manufacturers and really turning that into knowledge, right? And so this is the part of the ATM machine, which is really your pin code that you're going to be tying in. And that data really, I mean, we suffer as reps from truly a big data problem in that manufacturers send us a gazillion different formats of their sales. They want a gazillion different formats of uh, reports that you, they want you to turn in. Meanwhile, you're trying to manage your Rolodex. Your Rolodex, half the sales guys have them in their Outlook or Gmail contacts and aren't using any kind of central system to keep that managed to make it uh, easy for you to go develop leads for them. Uh, and, and ultimately, you need to take all that and synthesize it into something that makes an effective business process that you can control. And, um, and so just some of the data analysis that has yielded from those kinds of studies on that uh, an analysis of over 500 million in sales led to the following learnings. And, and this is just, just to point out, deals that uh, you win typically have 20 to 25% more activity uh, prior to it. And in this case, usually two weeks prior to the decision-making of the deal. Uh, also research-driven outreach increases response rates by three to 400%, meaning when you personalize and customize email-driven outreach and say, hey, I understand you're in the military market. Hey, I understand that you're you're doing this thing and you're doing that and you might have these pains in this market because you're in it. Um, those typically get three to 400% better response, which by the way, is still terrible. On an email uh, campaigning system like uh, you know MailChimps and Constant Contacts, you get about a 3% response rate typically, not open rate, but people replying back to you saying, hey, I'm interested. Um, this takes it up to about 12. So out of 100 that you do, you're going to get 12 responses that truly are that engage now uh, type of lead. So point is, you have to be able to do it at scale. Um, so what are some of the benefits of having great data? Let's imagine that you can go to your manufacturer and say, hey, let me synthesize this all into one big report so that when I wake up in the morning as a salesman, here's what I'm going to do. Um, why, you know, the benefits of great data are really as follows. Number one, everybody already knows it's a benefit. Uh, so 87% of respondents say that they're looking towards their data to drive how they're engaging with their customers and clients. And they view data as the foundation for uh, making important business decisions. So this goes back to the, the MBAs that have been learning all about data for 25 years, and now they're making data-driven data decisions uh, for their businesses, and ultimately that affects you as reps, right? Um, and this is from a survey of, of 2,300 global leaders from MIT Technology Review. And how do we really apply this to the rep business, right? How does how is great data? Let's say you, you know you had a magic wand and you wave that wand and said, "I have great data in my rep business." What would you do with it? Well, number one, here's some 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 ideas: drive business with synergistic selling. How about protecting existing business? You know. Uh, that would be where, hey, last year we did 60 grand on these products and this year we've only done 10. What happened to that business? Closing the loop of daily action. So what are the top 10 things I should do as a salesman today to keep my revenue increasing? And then finally, 
always having something to talk about. So this is the, the salesman in me saying, hey, um, when you go see a customer that you might have seen twice, but they're a really big customer and you might have seen them twice in the past two weeks, you've always got to have something to talk about. So mine your data to find those little nuggets that you and they both care about that will ultimately improve their business and improve yours. Um, so, you know, what we see in general, Rep Fabric coming from, you know, several hundred rep firms that we support, we see data all over the map from our manufacturers. And we see data that looks like this, which is simply just not machine readable. We see data like this all the time, which is very machine readable and synthesizable into that, you know, that, that uh, sales and commission dollar tracking that when you walk into an account, you can see all the lines you're selling them. You can see all the part numbers even that you're selling them and the trends that go with it, whether you're up or down, to really have a data-enabled salesperson conversation uh, with those buyers, with those engineers, and so on. Um, so, so that, you know, data is really important. And again, I would highly encourage you to talk to your manufacturer about getting out of this mode because it used to be an accounting function and this was okay and getting it more into this mode because this is truly now with tools uh, you know, like ours that will help drive that manufacturer's behavior. Um, and, and that's kind of what we talk about in this slide is just a little bit around the ERP system of the old days that the manufacturer has. This is how the process has classically worked. They print it out. They send you a report. You, you know, you get that in email or maybe it shows up when you get your commission check. Then someone on your team as a rep agency has to go in and figure out how to you know, demystify and unwind this data so that you know how to pay your different salespeople and different parts of your teams uh, and or, you know, you just you don't even try to unwind it. You just put the check in the bank and kind of kind of, you know, wing it from there. And we see everybody's doing both. You know, there's no there's no big trends to that. Uh, and then ultimately what you're really trying to do, though, is to break it down into sales. You turn it into a report. You then email it to your salespeople who look at it one time. Then it gets stuffed under the covers in their in their Outlook, you know, in their um, in their mobile app, and they don't look at it right before they go, or or in their Outlook in their um, in their laptop, and they don't really look at it until they go back into uh, you know the next month when they get that same report. Not certainly not where they're going to use it for data driven conversations with customers. Uh, then the same thing is true now today what you can do is, is also pump that information right out of an ERP system and sync it right into your sales tracking system, render that on dashboards that then immediately drive people's behavior. And, uh, and that is really kind of where our, you know, our future is going to be when that the transactional costs of the supply chains and doing this in sort of the classic old school way are just becoming too high. There's not enough margin in your commissions these days necessarily to kind of keep this up as the data grows bigger and, and you know, your businesses get bigger. And if you think about it, even the retail guys, right, the retail guys could tell you that, hey, we ship this product of, um, of shampoo off of the, the Walgreens around the corner five minutes ago because it's on a replenishment truck. And that's the system to system communication that really needs to get standardized and enabled throughout the industry. And, uh, and ultimately that's, you know, that's, that's what we're working towards because once you have that, then you can do the new really good stuff, right? And the new really good stuff is around artificial intelligence and how to harness that power to again, help augment you so that you become a super salesman that can do the work of three lesser salesmen just by yourself. And ultimately, uh, they talk about AI associated uh, CRM activity or front end selling activity to really unlock a lot of the the inefficiency of the sales processes between companies. And they think that by doing that, the value of that will be close to one point one trillion dollars by 2021. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit less than that because of COVID-19. But the point is, is I'd like to have 5% or 10% commission of $1.1 trillion, as I'm sure you would too, only because you're just operating in a more efficient super salesman manner. And so, you know, everybody says, oh, AI, it's, it's way off, you know, that's science fiction stuff. Well, believe it or not, it's not. And, and in fact, they talk about that it's going to create more jobs around 800,000 or so and, and direct jobs and then 2 million by induced jobs because people can get out of the transactional work and start to work on other things that make the businesses more important. Um, also, they 
28% said that uh, they plan to adopt AI technologies in the next two years. And this is a trade, a trade study from uh, 2017. So we're well into the world of AI. What is AI? Well, AI is really just a collection of spreadsheets. And that's really the way to think of it, right? Is, is it's not general intelligence. It's more like, like in the old days, if I had three monitors up and I'd, somebody asked me for a forecast, I would look at here's what I sold last year, here's what I sold, or here's what I'm planning to sell based on my my future pipeline and deals that I'm working on, and then I've got the spreadsheet for marking it up seven percent, turning it into my manufacturer and saying here's the number I think we're going to do next year. Well, what an AI can do is instead of doing that with three spreadsheets like a human can do, they can do it for a thousand, right? And so it can really find those needles and haystacks to make your business more efficient and figure out trends in many cases that you may not have noticed otherwise. And so um, when, you, when you talk about what is this going to do for your rep business, well, and how is it practical? I mean, are we really talking like the Starship Enterprise? Are we talking like this is something you could do today? And the answer is you can do a lot of it today. Uh, number one is trend detection. So, you know, what sales, what products and what territories are going up and down and why? right? Um, planning territory. So do I have the right spread of headcount amongst the deal flow that I've got coming in through those, those territories? And do I have the right people assigned to the right accounts as a result of that? What about things like profitability analysis by customer? If you're going to make 10 sales calls, don't get a single deal out of it. Maybe that shouldn't be a customer you call on anymore uh, or vice versa. You make two and you, you do big bucks, get in there more often. Um, opportunity to commission match or not, right? So that's another one that as, as the world kind of moves towards this, you know, not just the supply chain stock and flow side of your rep business, but to a specifier project job opportunity oriented side of your rep, rep business, um, being able to track sales that you spec in products in an engineer in one territory, and then it actually ships through distribution in another, being able to track and match that stuff so that you can go back to your manufacturer and say, hey, this business was because of me, so pay me on it. Um, that's the kind of stuff that you can do. How about things like automated appointment setting for your customers? So big drag for me was always, you know, I worked in a market where you generally had to set appointments. You know, folks who have more distribution oriented markets, a lot of times you can just stop in and see distributors and it's fine. They don't care. But if you have hard set appointments in your day to day calendar to set up a full day of visits when you have a manufacturer ride along day might take you a full day to set up those visits. So how about using AI to really set up those customer appointments, doing so by augmenting your email to set those appointments at scale um, and then naturally taming the email beast itself. Imagine an AI system that's watching your email and organizing it so that your reports are really spitting out for free to your manufacturers uh, and you don't have any big, you know, big project to sort of assemble that at the end of the month if you have to turn in a manufacturer's uh, report at the end. So um, all of these things are, are really there. And then I think, you know, the last one is prescriptive account selling, right? If you realize that there's trends on how you've been effective and the types of deals that you won, prescribe that to other accounts that look like the account that you've been successful in. And so these are the things where uh, ultimately I think it brings back the professionalism to the profession uh, and, and gets us more to be consultative as reps as opposed to just salespeople, right? And this is what Forbes said about salespeople. 3% of salespeople are trusted, 49% of doctors are trusted. So imagine when we can move to being sought after because we're so good. And the answer is you guys are that good, right? You've already got this expertise in technical areas. You've got the relationships in place to make stuff happen and unlock business that wouldn't normally be there. Um, and so what, what you just need is a little bit more boosting so that you can get that trustworthiness of the doctors and i guarantee for the customers you're very successful with they look at you as as more of a doctor rather than a salesperson and um and ultimately that's why you're able to go back in into that account and, and, and obviously that's what we're all working towards so um so one of the questions that comes up is can ai put out of a job i just kind of put a few things in here to lighten the mood um well ai is not perfect so in other words AI will deduce conclusions that make no sense in the physical world. It's just a machine running a big calculator across those thousand spreadsheets. So some of the funny ones that they came up with are that there's a, 
there's a correlation between per capita cheese consumption and death by entanglement and bed sheets, right? Um, probably not much of a correlation, but maybe, you know. Uh, what about drownings by pools, uh, by falling into pools and films that Nicolas Cage uh, appears in? And if you think about it from a math perspective, <laughs> these are what, what the math looks like. And this is ultimately what AIs are trying to do is match the curves and match the algorithms. And you can see that they kind of match here, but the, obviously there's no, uh, you know, there's no relationship between those two. I An mean, AI might think that there is. And uh, I just put that in because I thought it'd be funny to uh, poke fun at Nicolas Cage. So. <laughs> um, so lastly, along with that augmentation is that historically, you know, we talked about in the beginning that we don't want everybody wound up in the paperwork. And we're entering a new world of computing today where you really have um, kind of you don't have to look at screens anymore to get stuff done. And and ultimately, you can take that information where before you go on a sales call, get augmented on your drive to the account. Right. Or if you. Um, uh, you know, if you just complete that account call, make notes while you're driving to your next account for that follow up and for that efficacy and any reporting that you have to do uh, to those manufacturers. But most importantly, what do you need to do next to win more dollars and, and more sales at this account? So um, these are systems that exist today. I mean, we're, we're one of them. I'm just going to demo something real quick just to give you the idea. Alexa, open rep fabric. Welcome to the Rep Fabric skill. I can give you the briefing for a company. I can create activity journals and much more. What do you want to ask? A sales briefing for Rockwell Automation Austin. As of May 2020, sales were $282,787. 2019 sales were $1,479,205, making our run rate this year a minus 47% decrease over sales in 2019. Would you like me to break it down by line? Yes. As of May 2020, Delta purchases are $237,486. 2019 purchases of Delta were $1,388,500, making our run rate down minus 53%. Ludron purchases are $45,300. 2019 purchases of Ludron were $90,704, making our run rate up 38%. Would you like to have the briefing on another company? No. Okay. Would you like to create activity journals? Yes. Okay. I will create an activity. Which contact was it with? Ben Stiller. So my point is, is that, you know, in the future, even for folks who are not tech savvy, these kinds of products, this type of augmentation, if you build that ATM machine up within your company, can literally be served up audibly as they're walking into accounts. And likewise, their follow-ups can be audibly uh, dictated coming out of those same accounts. So even you know the greatest salespeople who are typically the worst at paperwork uh, really won't, you know, there's there's the ability to do this stuff as we speak. So um, so kind of in in closing, I'm just going to wrap up a few more things. So what is really the rep of the future look like? There's there's three legs to it. One is highly connected, meaning that, you know, you're connected, you're social, you're digitally amplified, that people are able to find you both physical world and, you know, by you traveling to their locations and scheduling appointments, but also sharing your expertise so that they find you online to help them in engineering projects as they come across them or in supply chain challenges that they have as they come across them. And then finally, you know, the last piece would be uh, making sure that you're digitally augmented so that when you do get in the seat in front of that customer or that distributor, you've got all the information ready to go so that you can have a meaningful and highly productive sales call uh, that ultimately leads to more sales dollars for your manufacturers, more sales dollars uh, in, in your commission as well. Um, so one final example here on how this stuff can be automated 
This is the appointment getter example. And just imagine a world that looks like this. You get a lead from your WordPress site or maybe your manufacturer sends over a lead from their site. You run it through your, your, your core system that goes and scrubs the news and tries to locate who these, you know, this person is or what their company's about. It reads them in LinkedIn. It adds them to your constant contact newsletter mass blaster. It updates the manufacturer's Salesforce system. It goes and reaches out, grabs pricing for the product that they're interested in. It stores the product sheet in your Google Drive. Uh, it runs through some part lookalikes databases and ultimately crafts an email, reads your calendar and says, okay, let me shoot this lead, an email that looks like this, right? Hey, Jeremy, thanks for your M. I'm the local rep from XYZ Repco. And uh, here's the product that you are interested in. And if this looks good, I'm also going to be in your territory next week on Thursday. Here's a link to my calendar schedule an appointment. Uh, here's the distributors that support this particular product from a standard stock and flow, uh, for example. And ultimately, that particular lead schedules time on your calendar. And that time then translates to you having it right on your mobile app so that you go in, you make that sales call after learning everything that's transpired up to this. Uh, and so you wake up in the morning on Thursday, you've got this appointment that's set. And ultimately, that information pumps right back out to your manufacturer's report that you need to turn into them on a monthly basis for the stuff you did. And that, you know, to me is what I call making the rep business fun again, because as field rep people, that's what we were born and designed to do. And, uh, and that's what you're great at, right? That's your superpower. And what we need to do is just get all this paperwork side of the business out of the way. And, and ultimately, you know, modern systems and that sales rep of the future will will give you that capability and uh, you just you just got to get there so um just kind of a few takeaways from this webinar and again thanks uh, for attending connect to your manufacturer's marketing engine so number one they're probably spending and doing money or spending money on this stuff you've got the greatest rolodex they've got marketing resources and you need to merge those two so have a marketing meeting with your manufacturer to figure out how do we, you know, how do we take it to the next level with our postings and repostings? How do we, um, you know, expand the content on our website that offers our expertise on certain, you know, if you're in the electrical business, here's why, here's how arc fault prevention works. And here's, you know, here's the products that XYZ manufacturers offers that does that, you know, write something because you've got a lot of that knowledge in your head. Here's why nitrile gloves are good for this particular uh, environment or this kind of facility. Here's the right furniture for um, that, you know, the old school uh, type of, of in, um, you know, industry, right? Put that all together. Make cell phone videos of the cool products, right? Today in, in, in the COVID-19 world, we're used to pitching in person and bringing sample books with us. Well, now we have to do that virtually. So just do it on your phone. You're probably getting better at it because of COVID-19, where you know more and more people are starting to use web cameras and, and so on and so forth. So just just consider yourself the the artist in the studio and go make some of that stuff, and your manufacturers will love it. Uh, what about just in general, what are you doing to increase your familiarity with prospects? If you go around and talk about all the target accounts in your territory who you know you, do you already know everybody or are there other folks that have no clue who you are? How can you develop that familiarity with them? Um, so that's, you know, that's really the thing. And, and again, I go back to scheduling a marketing meeting with your manufacturer to really tighten up how you merge your great Rolodex with, uh, you know, and your ability to spend and, and, and you know, put ads out there in your target target market, and then talk to them about how you get that not on your commission budget, but get it on a you know on um, co-op dollars, for example. Uh, then you know, I would encourage you, and if you got feedback, we'd be happy to share it with the group. What are you guys doing to develop your brand currently online, and what works, and how much effort and cost do you put into it? You know, these are questions that we're starting to pull our manufacturer. Uh, you know, folks that run rep fabric just so that we can understand it so that we can drop those costs to nothing and make them as, as effective as possible. How do you get a seemingly impenetrable company? How do you craft open the door from from that kind of company uh, that's really had you shut out for years, let's say, 
um, what do you, what tools are you using and how much time and effort are required? So if you think about those things, again, we'll continue to have forums like these and, and publish some of the best practices uh, around this. So be, be free, you know, feel free to check back with us on the website uh, for that as well. Um, and then for getting automated, just define that sales process and make sure that you've got a good segmented company Rolodex, categorize your contact interest, and then take advantage of the tools that are out there. Um, and so with that, Thank you guys very much for attending. I hope it was beneficial to you. I'd highly encourage you to go ahead and join us. Uh, actually, this is a misnomer here. This should be Friday, this Friday, if you want to see a little bit more about what we do at Ref Fabric. Uh, and then, I, again, highly encourage you and team members uh, to join the, the, um, the Growth Dynamics one with Charlie as well. So thanks, everybody, for attending. And uh, feel free to reach out and, and offer any feedback you can. We really appreciate it. Uh, we want to learn from these and make them as, as content rich as we can for you in the future. Thanks again. Have a good one.